Hello and welcome back to the Freelance Wars. I am here joined by Robert. Hello, Robert. Hello. Thanks for having me. I've seen Marco and Tak already in the comments, so please let me know. Just write anything, write audio okay, <laughs> stream okay, so we can start. Uh, this is very exciting. There are a couple of firsts happening here. Um, as you know, usually it's 6 p.m. on my channel, so it's the first time ever in like four years that it's not 6 p.m. That is because I'm doing a live, stre live stream with another creator, which is another first. Uh, Robert is based in Taiwan, is it, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's why, you know, the time difference. We are doing it a bit earlier today. Uh, that's the... I haven't seen any comments yet, so I hope anyone can hear us. Uh, but we want to do a QA. and a I, I, As you guys know, I do these Q&As like every every other time, every other two months, I do them live stream. So I thought it would be fun to bring someone else in. Uh, especially in this case, I think it, it could be interesting because he is a agency owner. So he's not, he used to be a freelance translator. Robin un answered something very nice. So we are live. That's good to know. And now he's Perfect. an agency good. owner. Uh, so we can, you know, answer the questions from both uh, an active freelancer and an active agency on the side. Uh, we both prepared a few questions for the people that don't know you. Uh, Robert, could you quickly say who you are? Introduce yourself a bit further. Sure. I'm uh, Robert Gephardt. I am. Uh, I started off as a freelance translator, as Adrian mentioned, uh, an Italian to English freelance translator. And um, and now I run a boutique agency, Lugano Translations, and uh, we um, so uh, for the purposes of this Q and A, I think it'll be interesting because for a living I work with freelance translators. I hire freelance translators, and that's what I do. Um, while Adrian is a freelance translator, and so we can hopefully give a perspective, answer questions from the point of view of you know of someone working as a freelance translator and someone who hires them. And um, so, yeah, I thought it was a very interesting idea. And I think this will be an interesting discussion. Yeah, exactly. YouTube rolled out this feature not too long ago. It was someone next, last year. Uh, it's only available on mobile. That's why you see the view like this, a bit unusual. But I think it's quite cool. Uh, we can both share this live stream. And there are still a couple of things that I will need to report to them. But it's, it's working quite stable. Uh, so Robin Humphrey asked, is there a theme for today? The theme is really whatever you want it to be. So uh, if you ask a questions, we will try our best to answer. Obviously, we don't know everything. I mean, we can just share our experience. But collectively, we have quite a few years of experience now, and I hope we can give uh, an answer to you guys and robbing straight up with the first question so we can jump into it. Cool. I have a, I have a potential agency client who has work, but they want me to get my own license for Trados. Is this normal? I really don't like Trados. Besides, I think that's a perfect question for you, Robert, to kick things off as an agency owner yourself. Uh, yeah, that's a pain. Um, it, it does happen, uh, but um, there are several ways around it. Uh, if um and uh, you can see also how flexible the agency is like if you can share it with anyone else who works with the agency or sometimes you can share it with other freelance translators um i haven't kept up with the latest versions of Tredos, but i'm sure you can you can keep doing stuff like that and i know on um, pros.com uh on the um i think on the community forums they have people who uh you know post that they want to uh, purchase Trados, and so they can, um, uh, you know, and so you can share the cost and share access to it and stuff like that. So there are ways around it, but it does happen um, that uh, that they ask you to, you know, provide your own license. Um, uh, you can also ask uh, to, for them uh, what type of files they need, because if you use Omega T, um, a lot of the same files, Omega T is a free um, CAT tool, by the way. And a lot of the files there are compatible with Trados. So if this is for a job that's not very big, um, you can just say that you can, uh, you know, you can work on the file via Omega T, and uh, and you'll be able to give them the, you know, TMX file or whatever it is. And um, so, um, so yeah, that's that's what I would say. I don't know, yeah, but uh, Adrian, you're probably more up to date with what's going on uh, from a freelancer point of view there. Yeah, I always had this question at the beginning because it's, you know, if you invest in like the, the, let's say the three big ones, that's extremely much money, right? For someone starting out. So 
I, I was also a bit hesitant to which one to go for, when should I buy a license. Um, luckily, they all have trial periods, so you can really try them all out for, for an extended period of time. Uh, if you, you know, stack them after each other, you basically have a free license of any cut tool for uh, quite some time, like a few months. So that's what I did in the beginning. And then, as Robert said, like people can grant you licenses as well. My first jobs that I did in Trados, I did for an agency and I didn't have to buy the license because they would just share a one time license for one job. Uh, but now, I mean, I it's also, you know, one of your only business expenses really that you have as a freelance translator, right? You have to buy a, a, a machine, a computer, and you have to buy a few tools to translate. Everything else is optional. So in a way, it's very low overhead costs anyway. So I see these tools as my primary working tools. So they're 100% tax deductible. And for me, it's a given that I have, I, I own licenses for, I think, three cut tools now and I still use ones that are free of charge as well. Uh, it happens very, very rarely that I translate or do anything language related, not in some kind of tool, right? So that's just in like Word yeah. or so that happens very rarely. How do you handle it with, with your freelancers? Do you have requirements? Uh I, I do not. And uh, I let them, you know, and some of them have uh, cat tools, some of them don't. And uh, by and large, it's usually fine with me. My end clients uh, don't, you know, don't deal with cat tools. And so for the jobs I have, I let them pick. It hasn't come up yet, um, but I think it's also by nature of the translations I do, um, you know, legal and financial, because I know for other ones, they're probably like really required. But um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you bring up a good point. Also, uh, the fact, yeah, if it's if it's a small job, you can probably use a free trial as well and kind of just get away with it there. And if it's a big enough job, it's probably worth the investment, you know, if yeah. um, if it lands you that job. So yeah, that's true as well. Robin follows up with, so why impose Trados on me? It's, but I would assume when I hear that, Robin, that it's a, a big agency, a big LSPs, and in that case, it's just processes, right? They don't want to deal yeah. with every freelancer working on with something else, so they just have their structure, and they don't really, they're not dependent on you, right? They go to someone else that uses Trados, if not, so they just want to have clear processes, and it makes sense in a way if you're a big company. That, yeah, that's why you should look for the boutique agencies. Exactly. <laughs> and Robin asks if you could please repeat your the name of your agency, Robert. It's Lugano Translation, right? Yes, Lugano, like the city in Switzerland. Lugano Translation. City in Switzerland. Yes, we are both Swiss, by the way. So that with with some yes. different language backgrounds, but in a way, both from the same place. Marco, a good friend of mine, asks, Robert, what are your main tools, techniques to attract new clients? By the way, we plan to be live for about 40 minutes, so that's why I'm heading to the next question now. I want to answer as much as possible. Uh, so do you, can you tell us some about your marketing, Robert? Uh, yes, I can. Sorry, we just got an earthquake here, so it's a bit... Uh... What? Oh, but yeah, it's, yeah. We we we're getting. It's, it doesn't seem that that big. So um, yeah, it, uh, but yeah, it throws me off a bit. Sorry. Um. Anyway, the um, uh, uh, sorry. The question was, uh, what do I use for marketing? Right. Yeah. Okay. So the um for marketing, it's uh yeah, that's a good question. Um. Uh. It, it's always kind of what I spend a lot of my time doing. When I'm not, you know, doing the admin or PM of, of jobs, in, of um, the jobs I already have and the clients I already work with, then it's, um, you know, it's all marketing. And uh, most of it is actually, it's similar to, um, I guess, what you guys would do because it's on LinkedIn and, uh, and word of mouth and stuff like that. Uh, but I would say one of the main difference, if you're looking from the point of view of an agency, um, the main difference is it's only with end clients. And so I concentrate a lot of the networking, not in the translation world, but in the legal world or in the financial world. And, um, and so this is attending conferences, um, you know, and networking being part of associations uh, that are, you know, bankers associations, chambers of commerce and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff like that. Um, I'm, is it, yeah, is it, most, it, is it broad, mostly yeah. locally or do you do you market internationally? Internationally, a lot internationally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in fact, it's uh, I, I I do some stuff locally, but most of my clients are still in Europe, uh, still in 
Switzerland and Italy and uh, and places like that. Um, and so I'm a member of the chambers over there, even though I'm over here. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it, it can get complicated as well. Um, but I would say to this point, and I don't know if this is just the nature of the thing, or maybe I'm not that good at marketing, but most of my new clients still come from word of mouth, um, from, you know, mm -hmm. past clients, but people I've dealt with before, people I know, stuff like that. And uh, so I really cultivate the relationships I already have. Yeah, I mean, knowing Marco, he would say that that's the top tier marketing. If you get clients through word of mouth, <laughs> that's, that's not bad oh. marketing. That means you're doing something right. <laughs> well, that's so, good to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, and, that, and that's the thing. Ultimately, I know, you know, exactly. We do a good job and, uh, and people are happy. And so I know that works well. Um, I would like to get better at doing stuff, you know, marketing online and uh, and whatnot. But uh, for now, that's that's how it's going quite, quite organically, let's say. Okay, nice. We have 14 people in here. It's amazing. Also, let me know where you guys are watching from. That's always interesting. Uh, yeah. Why I use asked, I recently worked on a project, but the company didn't provide me with Trados, so I had to download the free trial. Yeah, but that's fine. You know, you can always use that. That's. It also kind of shows you whether you like the tool or not, whether you want to invest in it. For any tool, I would always use the free trial if it's if it's around, right? So, yeah, it's, it's a good way to start. We also have a few questions prepared uh, in, in case there is none in the live chat. And at the moment, I don't see any new comments. So I'm just going to pick one up from the last Q&A from Stefan. He asks, is it always positive to offer translations for many languages or can it look less reliable? And is this the same if you specialize in many fields? How many language combinations should I have? Interesting question. Uh, I can maybe can, start from my point first, of view. Yeah. <laughs> um, it can definitely look, if you're marketing as a freelance translator and not as an agency, it can look unreliable and unprofessional if you offer 10, 15 language combinations, right? Because that's just not feasible. So the, someone who understands the market will e immediately know that you are not offering this by yourself. So either you are hiring other people and which means you're kind of turning into an agency and people are not buying from you and you should be transparent about that or i mean it even happens unfortunately that people just offer any language combination and just chuck it into google translate and deliver like that so i would be careful like if you really want to be the expert in a specific field and language i would limit your language combinations to your best ones so for most people it's one two or three uh, for me, it's two. Um, I don't know how this looks for you, Robert, when you're hiring freelancers, do you focus on how many combinations they have? Uh, yes, I do. Absolutely. And I, I uh, focus on the combinations and the specializations as well, um, because it is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bad sign to me if you have, uh, you know, too many languages and if the languages are unrelated, you know, if you have two, like, say romance languages and one, and the, the important thing is the target language, you know, the target language is into your native tongue, obviously. And so, but if you have two romance languages into, um, you know, one other language, that's fine. That's normal. If you start having eight languages that have no relation to each other into six different languages, you know, stuff like that, then yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and the same is true for specializations. If you're, you know, if you're medical, uh, uh, legal, financial and everything all in one, then then I assume you're nothing. And um, so I do believe uh, usually what I recommend is when you're first starting out, it's a bit difficult, like you're going to be a bit broad. Um, and I get that you're trying to see what works and, and what sticks. Um, but you should always have in mind to niche um, whatever you can and pretty much as much as you can. I think, you know, once if you can find your niche where you're really good at and you can do an, ast ast you know, astounding job. And, you know, I tell people, like, if you can become the best in the world at your particular niche, then you'll be fine, even if it seems like too targeted, um, because people will be seeking you out. And um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, that's usually what I recommend to uh, over time, try to narrow it down. OK, nice. Tamir is watching from Palestine. Wow. OK. I hope you are safe. Wow. Everything is OK. Uh, yeah, my question safe. to Robert is, as an agency owner, when you have 
work in languages that you don't know? That's such a good question, by the way. When you have work in languages that you don't know, how do you make sure the quality is good before delivering it? I always yeah. wonder that. Like, how can you deliver Chinese translation and be sure that it's good quality? Yeah. So this. So and and this is interesting because people uh, ask me about you know when they're setting up an agency and and, uh, and whatnot and I always tell them when you're first starting off especially if you're kind of a solopreneur if you're um, you know starting off small is to don't is to stick to your own uh, language combination because everyone feels like well my own language combination I can do the translation myself I'm like no no it's hard enough to hire other translators do all the admin project management so do it at least in the language you know because that adds a whole other level. And and rightly so. That whole other level is um, it, uh, very, uh, yeah, like with Chinese or something like that. It, it can be a lot of work. And um, ultimately what you do is you find translators and editors that you trust and that can work well with each other. Because uh, I obviously can't review something that's, you know, translated into like, uh, yeah, Chinese, uh, Korean, you know, my level isn't there. But um, if I have a translator and an editor who's paid to find mistakes in the translation, but, you know, obviously doesn't just find them just to get paid. Like you really need to kind of work with both sides. And, um, and, and that's why, you know, a good translator and editor, they're worth their weight in gold for me, for someone who runs a boutique agency like me. And, um, and yeah, you know, and that's what you shoot to have because then uh, when you have them and they can work well together, then I can sleep easy at night knowing that, um, you know, that a good job has been done. And uh, so, so yeah, that's that. Yeah, it's uh, it's, mis- it's yeah trust, right? So you have a few people that you trust, and then you make sure that they check the translation. Like if you work with a new Chinese translator, you probably have quality assurance in place with other people to to check their first jobs. I would assume, right? Yeah. So the way it is now, not yeah, especially if they're new, it's one hundred percent QA, one hundred percent quality assurance um, for every translation. And, uh, you know, and over time, if things work well, you can kind of, you know, uh, relax that a bit. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's really important there to be transparent as well, because like, I'm not an agency, but I do hire sometimes other translators to, to you know, to collaborate with, to, to proofread, to translate for me. And it has happened once that I was... Uh, experimenting let's say or just trying out a new translator and uh, the quality was horrible so i went back to them and i said look that this doesn't work this is not what we agreed discussed and then the person answering me suddenly said oh yeah uh, the pm here i will get this to the translator and you know i had no idea that i'm actually talking to a pm or to an agency like this was never discussed oh wow yeah they were just displaying themselves as a professional German translator native to Germany. And it was obvious to me that that has not been done by a native German. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the, I mean, I didn't pay it in the end. Uh, we found a different agreement, but just make sure out there that you don't get scammed. It's a very, unfortunately, unregulated industry that is very prone to scammers. It is, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, is good and bad. It, you know, it's good because you don't have to, jump through hoops or go through specific, you know, they're, they're no gatekeepers, let's say. Um, and uh, so if you can, if you're good at what you do, you can advance, but it's also bad because there's a lot of, yeah, scammers and bad people out there, but yeah. So Tamir is saying, thanks for worrying. Thanks for asking. The situation is difficult, but I'm safe. Okay. That's the most important. Good. Um, Marina is watching from Argentina. She's an English Spanish translator. Thanks for doing this live guys. Thanks for being cool. here, Marina. What time and is it there? Have... In Argentina? Yeah. If no, I do. Early, let me know, early Marina. Early in the morning, yeah. yeah. Also, let us know where in Argentina you are. I was just there last year. Oh, really? Yeah. I, oh, I lived there when I was very young. I don't remember, though. I lived in Buenos Aires. You did? Okay. Yeah, I You've did. You've been all over the world, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if you're wondering, the earthquake that happened during our call was a 4.4. So not that yeah. bad. It's just care. normal occurrence there. You're just so casual about it. No, no, I wasn't casual. It was um, <laughs> since since the big one we had two weeks ago. There've been every, once every three four days. There's kind of an aftershock. But really? uh, yeah. yeah, wow, I've never experienced that. That must be so weird. It still weirds yeah. me out. Yeah. Um, so I I don't know if you have more questions. Otherwise, I can also get to the ones that I have. 
We missed uh, quite an interesting, funny one from Marco. I want to ask you. Okay, okay. Robert, yeah. why did you decide to grow into an agency when life as a solopreneur is so much more enjoyable? <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. And, oh, and, and I can go on because I get this existent, existential crisis every now and then. I, yeah. I don't do any more translations myself except one job for one client that sort of got grandfathered in. And every like six months they have a report. Anyway, so I do that. And whenever I do that, I'm always asking myself, I'm like, why don't I just go back to doing translation? Because, it, and that's the thing with an agency, it's you end up not dealing with translations at all. It's all admin, project management, stuff like that. And that's all I do all day and marketing, right? you know, which I should be doing more. But um, the, the short answer, otherwise I'll go on for too long, is um, that I kind of wanted to see where, how far I could take it. And I, I did a video on my channel, I, I know, um, where I did, um, I, I showed the calculation I made. Basically, if I work X number of hours, even if I charge this much and, you know, work every day, every working day, let's say, versus if I'm an agency and, um, and you know, I, I work in more different languages, even if I assign it and have a translator and editor, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's more upside potential. And I kind of wanted to see how far I could take that. Um, what I did not take into account was, um, yeah, how much more stressful it is to achieve that. Like it's, uh, and uh, life was a lot more enjoyable as a translator. Um, I don't, it's, I, I like my niche now that I have as an agency as well, because I can still do it remotely as, and uh, I still do it remotely, even though I probably will be getting a lot better and more clients if we were back in Europe right now. But, um, I, uh, you know. That's that's where I am now, and so uh, yeah. you know, the good point. Life evolves, right? Yeah, and I mean, the the cool thing is that you you can always go back to it and do whatever. I mean, it's you're not fixed into doing that now, right? So that's yeah, exactly. And um, and yeah, and I am very tempted many times <laughs> remembering, yeah, how it was. Ate Udeng or Aid Udeng asks or says, Hello, I'm from the Philippines, an English Filipino translator, currently working on an editing project while watching this live stream. So cool. Thanks for tuning in. That's that's cool because I was wondering how the time zone would affect the viewers because no one ever like knows that I do anything at 11 a.m. in the morning. But now we get other people from the Philippines that probably otherwise couldn't be here in this live QA. So it's very nice that you have it on the side. And we still, we're only at 20 minutes, so we'll still be here for a while. Cool. Is, yeah, is Banyo, right next door. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Espanyo Amigos. Well, I work for a good company that hired me to proofread their products for Spanish learning. And they want that I become a project coordinator now. You know some softwares or tools to help me. Okay, so I, I would need a bit more information there. So are you hired as a freelancer or are you hired as an employee, first of all? Would they want you to do project coordination as a freelancer? If so, that can be a viable way to go down on, but it can be, I know a few people who do it or have attempted to do it, and it can be very difficult if you're not employed by this company because then it gets into a very gray, gray zone, right? Are they just hiring you as a freelancer for doing actual in-house work in order to, you know, save money on the obvious social contributions, etc. So I would be careful there, like, what is the actual work relationship? If you want to do that, if you want to become a freelance uh, translation coordinator, you can do that. People do that. For example, I think Kelsey Frick is a prime example who is doing that very well. Um, there are softwares to that help you with that. I know Monday.com is a good uh, PM tool. Uh, there's also Protimos and uh, the Bureau Works in, um, uh, tool also has a, a, a PM aspect to it. I'm not using any of them. I tried a few. In the end, I always go back to my Excel that is not professional at all, but it just works for me. So you need to figure out what works for you to track your, your um, work. My Excel has become quite elaborate now. It has a lot of functions in it, so it feels like a tool, but in the end, it's just an Excel sheet. So it, that's, again, goes back to what I said in the beginning. To do this job, you really don't have a lot of overhead costs, which is amazing. It's a great way uh, to start because the barrier of entry is so low. 
Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add to that, uh, you're absolutely right. The only thing I would add is, yeah, make sure if they're hiring you, um, well, first of all, congratulations, because it sounds like, yeah, it's a promotion. But yeah, I would make sure if it um, if it's freelance, like you're still allowed to work with other companies and, you know, and if so, do that. Or if it's supposed to be full time and they're your only client, then you're an employee. And, you know, you want to make sure that they're not hiring you as an employee without any benefits, like without giving you, you know, medical and blah, 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 and stuff like that. Because um, so you do want to check up on it. And, uh, you know, and because if they hire you as an employee, then you can check what software tools they have and, you know, and see if they can provide them for you as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, make sure all that's sort of clear uh, with them. Also check the laws. I don't know if you're in Spain, but uh, if you are, I'm quite sure that there is a similar law as we have here in Belgium, where you're not allowed to work as a majority of your client cannot just be one single client, if you know what I mean, because otherwise it's you are a fake employee right, or a fake freelancer. So for right. me, my biggest client can be 45% of my revenue. And that's important to keep in mind. Otherwise, you are obliged to be employed. Yeah. Um, Mark, I loved your answer, Robert, about being honest about your doubts sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it happens. And why <laughs> are is watching us from Sarajevo? Wow, amazing. Oh, wow. Never been, but that sounds cool. Me either. Awesome. I think we are caught up. So if you want to bring up one of your questions, feel free. Yes. Uh, yeah, wait, let me... Pick them up again. Yeah, so I have a couple questions. Uh, uh, let's see, from YV73LS. Um, I would like to know what your tips are for a good CV in 2024, is uh, the first question. Uh, so um, so uh, from my point of view, from you know, when I look at CVs and when I'm hiring people, obviously I look through CVs. Uh, I, I don't think much has changed in 2024. I know we have the AI stuff and everything going on. Um, I don't, uh, the main thing that's uh, for me is I look at the CV and then I check, I check you out on LinkedIn and, and wherever else pros, you know.com, something like that. So I think ideally you have their CV, you have your online profile, you know, LinkedIn pretty much or, and anywhere else. And that way I can see that you, that you're serious about translation and, uh, you know, and that, uh, you're in all these locations. It just makes my life easier. Um, other than that, uh, for 2024, I don't think there's anything specific to this year. I don't know. How do you feel? Yeah, I I, I don't know anything, to be honest, about CVs. <laughs> I don't have a CV. I don't do, I never send out oh, CVs. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn is my CV. I, uh, usually when right. I talk to people um, or when it gets to the point where we might have a collaboration, we already know each other from previous talks. I mentioned this many times on the channel. My approach is is um usually like thinking more long term like it's very rare that i th see a company or an agency and i just apply to be working with them i i try to establish a connection first and then down the line maybe it develops into work uh, of course that's a very luxury position to be in because i don't um, at the, currently i don't need to look for more work so I, Everything I do in, in outreach is for potential future work that I could then replace something that I have now with. And so the only times that I did CV outreach was in the beginning. And uh, I followed uh, someone on Facebook back then. It was a Facebook group that kind of showed the template of a translator CV. Because the only thing you have to keep in mind is that it's not a CV like in the traditional sense necessarily, right, where you... Uh, where you list all your experience going back to primary school because that's that's not really relevant. I don't know if when you're looking at the CV and someone has, I mean, it might be relevant if it's other experience in the field that you're translating in, right? If if someone is is uh, has experience in Salesforce and you're looking for someone in Salesforce translation, then it's relevant, of course. But other than that, you don't really need to include your your uh, experiences going very far back. Uh, rather yeah. focus on, on like portfolio, you know, have a nice portfolio where you can link to, have a nice flyer, uh, um, brochures, marketing material, in my opinion, is much better than a, a CV. Yeah, and, and the only thing I'd add to that, yeah, is in terms of CV, a CV as a freelancer, it, it is very different from, 
the CV as an employee or, you know, what, what you usually learn in school, because yeah, uh, it has a different focus. You're there to, so you can handle the job at hand. You're not there to see if you fit the company culture, can grow with the company and be a good coworker and this, that, and the other. And so, um, so it does serve a very different, per- and I, I go into more detail, like in my course and stuff like that. So I won't do too much, but yeah, the, the main thing is make sure every single thing in your CV does pertain to the job at hand, quite frankly. Um, yeah, you know, stuff like if you taught snowboarding uh, 10 years ago, doesn't matter. Like, you know, you can leave that stuff out. Don't worry about gaps in your resume. That doesn't uh, matter nearly as much. But uh, like Adrian said, your portfolio and and frankly, LinkedIn, I, I, I agree. Being on LinkedIn is probably more important than any CV and uh, just having all your information up to date there. So um, and that's uh, that's yeah, in 2024, yeah. it's yeah, same as. And I always try to tell people, uh, I see now a, a comment from Tommy who kind of goes into the same area. He's saying, how do you prepare for an interview with a client? And that's that's what I try to always say to people. Like, don't, don't look at yourself as someone who is looking for a job and who is applying to a job and having an interview, right? That's that's already the wrong balance because you're already putting yourself much lower than the client. You're just looking at them as an employer, right? Do you want to be the service provider. You want to provide a service and not not apply for a job. So that's already like when I see how do you prepare for an interview with the client. That's a that, that's a should be a business negotiation, not an interview, right? So yeah, like, there there should that, be a that, shift in mindset. You need to put yourself on the same level. That's that, and that's yeah, and that's a very good uh, mentality for um, you know, and end client mentality rather than a translation agency mentality. I guess, yeah, yeah. and I think, and um, but yeah, absolutely, because you provide a benefit to them. So yeah, you briefly mentioned your course. Do you quickly want to tell the viewers what it is? It's down in the description as well if you want to look into it. Yes, uh, um, uh, yeah, and I, I know I always forget to mention it. It's I, I do have a course out. It's called How to Be a Successful Freelance Translator, and um, and yeah, I think Adrian linked to it down below. And it's uh, it's the course I first created it, I uh, close to maybe ten years ago because there was nothing, no information available, and it and it was annoying. And uh, you know, and obviously since then I've been updating it from the point of view as an agency, you know, seeing what's needed to be hired and stuff like that. And, um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's an online self-paced course that, uh, that you can feel free to check out. It's on the link down below, I assume. Yeah. It is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what down below is in the live stream. So I, I don't know or, where yeah. it is. It's, it's somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. But this will also um, be a video. So if you're watching this later on, you couldn't join us live, then it's definitely down below. Yeah. And I'm going to put this on my channel. Uh, as well in the near future so yeah it'll be there yeah the, um, the idea was initially that i hoped youtube would have figured it out that we could both be live and share this on both channels but it's not there yet maybe one day it will be there yet i would i would yeah. assume that would be the whole point of a co-life right but at yeah, the moment it's over here <laughs> yeah um i have another question if uh if that's okay um yeah sure th- th- uh, th- this is also actually from YV73LS. Um, what, do you, what do you think translators are missing out about ChatGPT? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised it took this long to get to ChatGPT. Um, <laughs> there is uh, much information about why it won't take our place in the market. So I think it could be very nice to know how to incorporate that tool too. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what you mean about incorporate that tool uh, in terms of handling translations or not um so chat gpt it's um i think it's good to be familiar with everything going on whether you know with all this ai and stuff like that it, you do need to keep in mind stuff with chat gpt a it has a very typical style i can absolutely tell when stuff has been translated using chat gpt um and in fact people use it now i get 15 to 20 like cold emails a day probably and um i can tell when they're written by chat gpt because people love to do that too it uses the same expressions and stuff like that but having said and also keep in mind chat gpt is not confidential anything you put in there will end up on a database somewhere so if you're working on something confidential um you know you need to worry about that plus companies worry about it in terms of liability because if chat gpt messes something up 
then um, you know they ChatGPT cannot be held liable, and so yeah, it, it raises a bunch of issues uh, depending on what you're working on for clients. Um, but uh, I do think it's good to uh, you know play around with it and see what it's capable of because um, you know it can it, it's a tool and uh, so it can be helpful. I mean, uh, yeah, that's very broad in general, but. I don't, exactly. I don't know what, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a nice it's a nice assistant, right? Like we had a virtual assistant for a long time. It's just uh, on another level at that point. But I would not use it for translation. Rather, if you want to incorporate um, technology into your translation process, then rather look at actual like machine translation tools, right? Uh, right. Rather than ChatGPT, because they are focused on the actual task at hand. That's why I always find it a bit funny that when ChatGPT came out, there was this huge uproar in the industry, whereas it it has nothing against the actual MT tools that, that we are already right. facing since 2017, right? Um, and actually, Marco asked kind of a, a question relating to that. He said, 10 years ago, everyone thought translators would be replaced by MT, but in reality, business has probably increased for you guys in those 10 years. Now, there is a, yeah, there is... In the business, the, the localization industry has definitely increased, increased like fivefold probably, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has increased for translators uh, because in with that you get a lot of uh, price pressure, a lot of um, just uh, demand that is unreasonably uh, met by people working for peanuts literally. So it's a positive a positive growth of the industry doesn't necessarily reflect something good for the individual right uh, but there is definitely ways that you can incorporate uh, tools into your daily life to become more efficient while still promoting proficiency professionalism in the industry as well yeah and and just to add to that and i think in a way like he's right because before chat gpt it was google translate before that, and they're being translated. Before that, people there was a Skype translate, and it, there was always some type of like AI that was going to make translation obsolete, and uh, and yet it's still here. Um, I think you're right about in terms of the fragmented market, and um, not to get too much into it, but I really feel like this is what ChatGPT and things like it do. Is it sort of separates the market in that you're you're going to have people doing stuff for really cheap because they probably use ChatGPT and they you know whatever. They churn out, they churn out. And, you know, there's some big agencies that'll keep doing that. And, uh, and yeah, that'll, that'll happen. But at the same time, you do have people who want good translators in their niche market and know what they're doing. I deal with end clients and literally 100% of the end clients that I deal with, uh, law firms, banks, you know, uh, corporations, literally 100% of them, you know, know that ChatGPT is not perfect, like that it makes mistakes that they cannot rely on on it. And, you know, so when people say, oh, they don't want translators anymore because they all use ChatGPT, they know not to use it. But they also know that translators, if, you know, these cheap translators, like, can waste their time and money uh, by um, by basically spitting out stuff that also needs to be corrected. And so, um, so I think being able to niche yourself, I keep saying that, but yeah, being able to do that and uh, really be really good at what you do and add value, um, you know, that's where... Uh, the growth and the money is going to be. And uh, and so I do think it's good to, you know, keep that as a goal for the long term. And if you want to uh, incorporate MT into your daily workflow, I would say focus on two main things. One is transparency and one is confidentiality. You can do the latter by buying a tool, buying a software and actually paying for the subscription because then at least you have the encryption behind it. Of course, you're still providing a company with data. I mean, there's a whole, yeah, that, that's another question. They can say as much as they want that they will not look at it. You are giving your client data away. Yeah. Uh, and transparency is really important because I, as a buyer, I would not want post editing if I'm not buying post editing, right? So I'm very transparent with my client. If I see a use case, that is very, very like ideal for MT, then I will just tell my client, look, for this case, it makes sense to do posted thing because this is a standardized text. There is no creative writing. Um, it's it's very straight to the point. It's basically literal translation word for word. Uh, I will do this post editing. What you then do is you you show transparency. You show like, okay, this guy actually cares about our bottom line. So we can save a bit on this job. 
And then in the next job that is probably going to be more creative, they trust you more with your judgment because you can show them that you are willing to say when it actually makes sense to use MT. That's my approach. Obviously, that doesn't work when you're starting out and working with big agencies. Uh, all these advice are for more down the line, of course. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I also want to make a correction. Actually, my thing wasn't up to date. The earthquake that happened during the thing was a 5.3. What? So that's really yeah, big. So, yeah. So who's that's so I I feel justified in feeling, uh, yeah, scared. So now I'm gonna moment. I'm gonna title this video "Earthquake Life on Air." <laughs> that it flustered me a bit. Easy. But, uh, okay. Well, yeah. glad you're okay. Um, we are at forty minutes, so maybe we can take one more question. Let me just check the comments. Ufuk is saying he's watching from Turkey, or she, I don't know. Very nice. Hello. Uh, Hello. I think this above, I didn't miss anything. Hopefully, if I missed anything, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Chase yeah. Smith, speaking of tools, do either, if you, do either of you know a good tool to accurately reproduce formatting of non-editable PDFs? I do this manually by word, but it's very time consuming. Ah, so you mean making word, making PDFs editable? Um, but, or, I mean, yeah, maybe a, yeah, desktop publishing kind of. Yeah, tool, exactly. I that's guess. that's yeah. another service, right? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know if you offer this, Robert. No, and in fact, I uh, when I was a translator, I, I kind of specifically said that I'm, you know, I don't offer DTP services, unfortunately, and so um, so yeah. You know, uh, what I ended up doing for some people who needed yeah, financial statements and stuff is just do it on Excel and kind of copy and paste it into Word. Um, mm. But uh, but no, sorry, I, I know very yeah. little even, yeah. even now about. Yeah, whenever I have ed uneditable text, I always go back to the client and say, you, I need either I need an editable format or I can do a translation, but they will I will just add comments in the PDF, you know. With the with the comment function and just add it there like yeah. that, but I've and, never um, done but, like a certificate or a transcript or something. Right, and if if it means about parsing out the text from like an image PDF or something like that, then you can use an what's called an OCR on uh, optical character recognition tool. Um, the yeah. one I use is onlineocr.net, I think. Um, but yeah, you can look up OCR, and that it just you know looks at the image and kind of detects the text. You pick which language and and the the one online ocr.net is quite good, I find. Um, okay, yeah, I think that's what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And Robin just answered you as well, Jay Smith. So maybe check oh, his yeah. answer. Okay, maybe you have a last one that we can. I did, yeah, I have a couple I didn't get to. Yeah, let, let me do the last one. Um, uh, here, um, what is high in demand in translation and subtitling industry in 2024. Um, now, and, and I, 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 I'm picking this one because uh, I think it's the wrong question and I get this a lot. People ask me what, what's high in demand in terms of specialization or even language combination and stuff like that. And I think um, the problem with high in demand is that it's high in supply as well. And so if you're set, starting out there, there are gonna be a million and a half other people uh, trying to do the same thing. But if you have something that's a bit more rare, um, you know, then it can be like, you know, if you do like say German and English, they're quite popular and, you know, so you can find clients, but you also have other German to English translators. If you're just entering the market now, you, you know, you'll have Adrian Probst to, you know, and, uh, and his, he's your competition and you don't want that. But if, uh, if you have like German to, um, I don't know, you know, Lithuanian or, uh, or, you know, even something like Portuguese, you might say, well, it's not a big enough market, except, um, you know, that way, right away, you can be well known in that industry. And, and the same goes for specializations. I think looking for what's high in demand is sort of the wrong way to look at it. Um, and yeah, maybe at the beginning, you kind of, you know, because you're, you're kind of seeing what sticks. But I think you want to focus on what you can be good at. And in fact, if it's not high in demand, all the better. You know, all you need is, you know, three, four, five regular clients and you're earning a great living, you know, um, and uh, with uh, with what you do. And so you don't need a place where there are, you know, 2000 different clients uh, and, and but you have all the competition for them. That that's my opinion. I don't know what 
what what do you absolutely think? yeah that's a good answer yeah uh, i i didn't think of it from this angle but you're absolutely right i once made a video about the highest paid language combinations in in the industry and i just gathered information from other articles you know and from experience and i made a top 10 list but then i very specifically said that it doesn't ma it's it's not at all a negative thing if your language is not in this list right it can actually be a positive thing right because like it if 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 your language is very much in demand no it was in demand not highest paid sorry it was in demand mm -hmm. but let's say probably spanish and arabic i would say are probably one of the top in demand uh, but that doesn't mean that the market is not really stable in that area right whereas icelandic is not in demand at all but if you can be even just one of the top uh, icelandic translators you can charge a lot of money uh, mm -hmm. so in demand is is indeed not the right approach to go uh, that's that's also something that people ask themselves like when they think about what what university subject to study for example uh, a lot of people would just go into you know what is currently in demand or just go for business because it's it's a good it's a good way to go because it's always in demand but then what if you hate it right and you don't want to spend uh, hours like we we spend so much time working in our life so you don't want to spend all these hours into something that you don't really enjoy uh, of course, you can always, you know, pivot your specialization later on. I never started out as a sports translator. It just happened naturally. Uh, I kind of made the same mistake. I went for IT in the beginning because I thought that's that's currently in demand. But then if there are so many people that are better than you out there, if you're just going after in demand, right, you need to go after your experience, your expertise and your passion. And then it's much easier to get to the top. Yeah. When I, oh, and, and I forgot to mention, sorry, the question was by Vivian uh, VH4 MD. Okay. So, it's uh, probably not yeah. the answer that she wanted, but. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, um, hopefully it yeah. helps still, yeah. Okay, perfect. I think we're coming to an end. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining. Um, may Yeah, you, you said you will also upload it to your channel, right? So people can I head over there. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and yeah, thank you for having me and sorry. And thank you for accommodating for the time schedule. Uh, hopefully it was uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice viewership. It was no problem. And now I'm off for the end of for the rest of the day. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're going back, back, back to the motherland, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah. I'm taking the yes. train in a few hours. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks everyone for, for watching. Uh, nice that you were here. Nice that you made time. Great co life. Thanks for great info. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Robert, I've already emailed you. Okay. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, this was amazing. Yeah. It was awesome. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Have a nice day. And I see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.